How do you build a sustainably successful business? And is it true that what you do day to day actually can kill your dreams? The video you're about to watch is a presentation that was given at an Entrepreneur Circle event in January 2024. It was delivered in the round. There are about 300 business owners in the audience and they all found it hugely thought provoking and I hope you will too. This video, this presentation will hopefully enable you to unlock any sense of overwhelm that you might have and it will give you a set of tools that will enable you to rapidly move your business forward to where you want it to be. I hope you enjoy, because we're all busy. None of us are sat around twiddling our thumbs on a Tuesday afternoon wondering what to do. Um, but the busyness and the frustration does not change the fact that you failed to act. And we'll talk about this in a minute as to what this means. Training and knowledge is nothing without the will to act. And, and, and here's the thing, the thing about Batman, who I, is by a country mile, my, my favorite kind of superhero, is that, is that Batman is the only superhero with no superpowers. Batman has no superpowers whatsoever. It is just Bruce Wayne and the will to act. He took the decision to do things. And um, it's helpful that he had the means, etc. It's a story. I know it's not real. Um, just remind me, actually, at, at the event when we played this in Bolton, and when some of you here today were, were at that event, we, we themed the whole event around superheroes. And um, we found a guy who um, it, plays the role, uh, you can hire him, of Superman. And, and he absolutely looks the part. I mean, he's six inches taller than me, huge guy, absolutely kind of, you know, buff and trim, and he's got this amazing costume. And he looks like Superman. And I remember we were talking, I'd got this, and I'd booked him to come to our event, and a lot of people were there had pictures with Superman. And um, I told one of the two, and we booked Superman, and um, one of my colleagues said, what, the real one? Um, <laughs> <laughs> which would have been an ask. But with Batman, he the, the, no superpowers, just the will to act. And this is definitely worthy of reflection. And, and certainly, and I'm sharing this because it's played a big part in, in, my, in my journey. There have been uh, multiple times over the years in particular where I've recognized that this is absolutely, this is on me now. I have to take control. I have to drive this and push this through. And there will come those times for all of us on our path, on our way to, to building a, a sustainably successful uh, business. And what, what having the will to act, what it actually means, and it's been picked up by one or two people and it's been used as people have picked it up on training course names and all sorts of things. The, the origins, I think, do come back to that, that day in Bolton um, in, 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 in 2014. But for us as entrepreneurs, what it means is us actually taking decisions, deciding to go. Um, I'm going to do this. What does that mean? What are the implications? Let's follow it through and make it happen. Um, it means there's actually being appropriately decisive. We don't have to be impulsive, but neither do we want to luxuriate for weeks or months, as many people do, um, about a decision. Um, people dither and dally way more often than they are decisive. And it is, it's about uh, deciding to go. It's about you making that decision. Am I going to do this? Yes or no? Either decision is fine. The will to act is taking the decision. If the decision is yes, then there are things to do. If the decision is no, then box it off, park it, leave it, it's gone, it's done, and we move on to the next thing. But the ability to take decisions, and so many people, and this is something that you know, I've fought really hard and I've not been immune to this in my own business, but I fought really hard to not drift. And we are quite decisive. Um, and and, and it's, it's interesting because sometimes that some of the hardest decisions I've taken, um, I look back now and think, well, what, what was I worried about? This time last year, I was flip-flopping around whether we should do an event on, around AI. Uh, the start of last year, AI was just starting to come to, 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 to the fore. ChatGPT was launched at the end of November 2022. And, and, and there was, I was seeing all sorts of things that we could do. 
and, and I was oohing and ahhing, do we do this event? Because when, when you decide to do an event, it's a, it is a significant undertaking. Uh, it requires a lot of effort and energy to um, fill the room and get people to come, and then you've got all the content to prepare, and then all the follow-up and everything else. It's, it's, it's a non-trivial thing. And I carried that decision for, in truth, three or four weeks. We had a number of discussions about it in the office. And it looks stupid now, but gen I mean, genuinely, I, I was really close to saying, oh, we're not going to do it. We're going to park it. We're not going to do it. Um, and then um, we decided to do it. And I mean, goodness me, it was, a, it was an extraordinary thing last year. I was, I was stunned. At, um, it was one of the biggest events we've ever put on um, when we ran that in, in, in May last year. And I've got a little bit of news, by the way, uh, very good news that you'll you like and you'll enjoy um, about what we're doing with AI this year, which I will share with you um, after, the, after the morning break. So this ability to, to take action, to make decisions, to do the right things, is a really significant element of determining whether or not you achieve the potential and the success uh, that you aspire to uh, in, in, in your business. And um, it was really um, not in the same way I've just talked about now, but it was brought home to me uh, in March 2003 by, by this fellow, Martin Howey. And um, Martin um, lived at the time in um, the same little suburb village of Dickens Heath that I mentioned yesterday, uh, where, where I was living. And um, Martin had retired uh, from his business. And um, he took an interest in what I was doing. And, um, and he used to pop round, I don't know, maybe two or three weeks probably, just for a cup of tea. And we'd have a little chat, and he would give him the benefit of his wisdom. He had a long career in... Um, uh, in, in business. He was 25, 30 years older than me. And, and I found our conversations um, really helpful, really interesting, really useful. And, and I'd been in business um, only a couple of months. It was March 2003. I remember it really clearly because it was the day that the American soldiers had arrived in Baghdad and were heaving down that big statue of Saddam Hussein. That had been on the lunchtime news when I had my lunch in my kitchen at home. And the doorbell rang and Martin Howie came round and we I made him a cup of tea and we sat down in, in my lounge at home and we started having a little conversation. And, um, and Martin asked me a question and he, he said, Nigel, what, what's the most important thing you've got to do for this business of yours to be a success. Now, at this point, I'm kind of eight or nine weeks into this, my entrepreneurial journey. And that was a really tough question. And I thought, oh, I flipped and flopped around a little bit. But, but I got to the point, I said, well, I figure really that the most important thing I've got to do, Martin, is I've got to get and keep enough customers. I figure if I get and keep enough customers, then one way or another, I'll be able to cope and deal with everything else. And he said, no, I think that's right. I thought, phew, I like to get things right. I felt good. He said, uh, so when are you getting and keeping customers today then? I said, sorry. He said, well, he said, you're a, a smart guy. He said, I know that the success of this business is probably the most important thing in your life right now. And it was for all the reasons that I talked about yesterday. You know, I had that extra hundred grand on the mortgage. I had the shame and humiliation to avoid. I had these goals I wanted to avoid. I to get my kids into solid school. There were, for lots of reasons, the dominant thing in my life in the spring of 2003 was my business being a success. And what he just helped me to understand and work out was that the, oops, sorry, I've just knocked my microphone off. Uh, what he helped me to understand and work out was that the most important thing for me to achieve the success that I aspired to was the getting and keeping customers. He said, well, surely any sane, sensible person, once they understand what the single most important thing is, would have some time set aside every day to do that single, single most important thing, which is logically utterly compelling and clearly right. But I didn't have any time set aside that single most important thing. He said, what have you done today? It was early afternoon, remember? I thought I'd been quite busy. I was up quite early. I was in my office upstairs, my 12-step commute um, to the, uh, the back bedroom. I was in the office by half past seven. Uh, I'd done some work for a client. Uh, I'd done a bit of my bookkeeping that needed to be done. Uh, it was interesting because the postman arrived and there'd been a couple of checks in the post. Remember those days? And uh, so I'd nipped out to the bank to bank the checks that had come in. And um, I'd, I'd taken care of, I'd been busy. I'd, I'd had a very busy morning. 
But I hadn't done the single most important thing. I hadn't focused on getting and keeping customers, which I did now know and understand, thanks to his question, was the single most important thing. And as a result of this conversation, you know, one afternoon in March 2003, I started a habit and, and we'll come back to habits a little bit later on uh, to, to, today because I started this habit and, and thankfully I found it a very easy habit to adopt. And uh, so the next morning when I got to my office at half past seven after my 12 step commute up the stairs, I didn't do all the other stuff. I focused on the single most important thing. And I spent the first 90 minutes of my day doing the single most important thing. And I started to focus on getting and keeping customers. And it is a habit, genuinely, that, you know, I'm going to celebrate my 21st anniversary of this habit in, in just five or six weeks' time, because it will be 21 years that I've fundamentally been doing this every single day. There are exceptions. I haven't done it this morning. We've got a big event on. But on a normal day, which most days are normal days, I get to the office. I still arrive. I'm a morning person. I'm usually in the office before half past seven. And, and I go into my office and the door is shut and nothing gets in. And between until kind of nine o'clock, 9.15, I do the things that are most important to me that are most important to my business, that are going to make me and my business more successful, that are going to move us towards where we want to be. And I've told this story and I've talked about this, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of times over the last, you know, certainly the last 15 years since we created Entrepreneur Circle. And, and I still find people come up to me and say, do you really do you really do your 90 minutes? And, and But honestly, if you look at everything we've achieved, and we've achieved a lot, you know, over um, the, this time during this odyssey. But it's all, when you look back and analyze it, if anyone was to do so, it's all been built in 90 minute chunks. And in terms of finding the will to act, we're not, we're none of us are Batman, we're not superheroes, that's ridiculous at one level. But actually, for 90 minutes a day, we could be. For 90 minutes a day, every single day, every single one of us, could find the will to act. We could box off all the other distractions out there, whether they come from customers or family or staff or social media. We can box them all off. We can keep them all outside and at bay for 90 minutes a day. And if and when we're able to do that, what we'll find is that we are liberated to take the decisions, to do the thinking, to take the action that moves our businesses towards where we want it to be. It was Kennedy, Dan Kennedy, that taught me that the first big leap, this, is a, you know, this, 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 this phrase is riddled with such powerful little phrases, the first big leap, not a little leap, not a mediocre leap, not an average, but the first fucking big leap from being an ordinary business in the 60% and the 20% of the pyramid, the first big leap towards being a big income business, it comes quickly. It doesn't come over several years. It comes quickly once the business owner, that's you, makes the intellectual emotional and actual switch. Intellectual, we think about it properly and we understand what we're doing. Martin Howey helped me to make the intellectual switch. He opened my eyes to the folly of the way that I was running my business. So I, the intellectual switch in my life, on my journey, in my business, I owe that intellectual switch to Martin. You can pick this up and embrace it today. The emotional switch 
That's got to come from within. That's you actually recognizing and feeling. And rec it's one of those beliefs that we talked about yesterday afternoon. That third belief that, that it's the marketing and the selling that will be the defining factor. Whatever business you are in, whether you are pursuing riches and wealth or you're pursuing impact and fulfillment or some kind of combination of the two, whatever it is that you are pursuing, the marketing and the selling will be at the heart of you achieving it. That's the emotional switch. But we can make the intellectual and the emotional switch and nothing will happen unless or until we make the actual switch. Unless or until we do actually box off the outside world. We do keep our customers and our staff and our phone calls and our emails and our social feeds. We keep them all away for 90 minutes a day. And we make the actual switch for 90 minutes a day. Seven and a half hours a week. That's all it takes to make the big leap quickly from an ordinary business to a big income business because in those 90 minutes you become a marketer of your thing not a doer of your thing and I gave a lot of thought because the majority of people in this room the majority of you on the live stream have heard me talk before about 90 minutes but I failed you I failed you because you haven't yet made the actual switch. N literally no one has ever argued intellectually with me about the power and the impact that the 90 minutes can bring. No one's ever taken me on and said, Nigel, you're wrong. If I spend 90 minutes a day on the market of my business, it, it won't have that impact. Everybody accepts the rationality of, of that concept. Yet why is it that such a small percentage of people, such a small proportion of members of Entrepreneur Circle have made the actual switch? Because I know that's true. It's one of my biggest, deepest regrets that over the last 14 years, I haven't been able to convey sufficiently compellingly the power and the reality of what this does, of how it is transformational to your business and ultimately to your life. All the stories that I told you yesterday, all, the, all those little bits of good fortune that we had, I can track them all back to the result of me doing the 90 minutes because I started doing my 90 minutes in March 2003. And every single working day since March 2003, I've done my 90 minutes. I'm not alone. There are plenty of EC members who also have adopted that approach. They've made the intellectual, the emotional, and the actual switch. But we're still in the minority. And as I was pulling this event together, this, this for me, this bit, this moment now, this is the most important bit. There's lots of other stuff that's useful. There's bits that are more entertaining. There's some that are more insightful. There's a few bits, fuck you, I haven't heard them before. But this bit, this is the bit. This is the step. This is the single biggest thing that has the potential to move you. But it requires you not just to make the intellectual switch. Most of you have got that. Not just to make the emotional switch. Quite a lot of you have got that. But you haven't yet made the actual switch. And you can't make it today because you're here. You could make it tomorrow. But that would require you to do something. That would require you to have the will to act. You could open up your diary whilst you sat here now. You could go in and you could make a series of 90-minute appointments with yourself. You could, if you're a morning person like me, 
you could clear your diary until 9.30 or 10 o'clock or whatever, whatever time it is that you normally get into business, into work, into your place of work and clear those first 90 minutes. And if that's really too difficult, start with 60 minutes because you can still get a lot done in 60 minutes. And 60 is way better than 90. And 60 is way better than doing fuck all, which is what's happening now in most businesses. That pyramid that we talked about the 60 and the 20, what are the people in the 60 and the 20? The 80% of people in your industry, in your sector, your peers, your competitors, your players, what do they do with the first 90 minutes of their day? I know what they do. They turn up at work and they get stuck in to the day-to-day. -day. There's always stuff to do. We're running businesses. There's always stuff to do. We'll, it'll be many, many weeks if, you know, before we, we run out. There's always stuff to do. What I've discovered over the years is that it's the day-to-day -day that kills dreams. Think about that. It's all the day-to-day -day shit, all the little stuff that we can turn up at work and it will just come at us. It will come at us from our customers. It will come at us from our staff members. It will come at us from our suppliers. There's always stuff for us to do. But it's not the important stuff. It's not the stuff that requires the will to act. The important stuff, and I'll talk more about this later on this morning, the normal stuff, that's what will move us forward. It's the day-to-day -day that ends up killing dreams. That is a real photo. That is the sign that I have on my door. You know, I did it symbolically. Like a long time ago, that must be 20 years old, that sign nearly. Um, we used to sell them. Hello, I'll buy some if you want some. Email support entrepreneur circle, I'll send you one. Genuinely. Um, I haven't got any, I'll get them made for you. Because I'll, I'll, because, because this is, for me, this is like the most important thing. Because we, we, we do know a lot of stuff about how you market and promote and sell businesses. You know, how you make it happen, how you crack the rhythmic acquisition of customers. We know a lot about this stuff, but all of it requires things to happen in your business. And unless or until you've made that intellectual, emotional, and actual switch, none of that other knowledge is going to matter because you won't be able to execute or implement, or at best, what you'll do is execute and implement on a kind of ad hoc occasional, having a bit of a dabble basis. Remember those six core beliefs yesterday? Commit, not dabble. Here's the big ultimate manifestation of this. You know, nodding yesterday, you all agree, got those six beliefs, say, I understand all this now, I'm committed. Well, we'll find out if you're committed or not by this time next week. Because by this time next Tuesday morning, you should have done five 90-minute sessions on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday this week, and on Monday and Tuesday next week. And by this time next week, you will know, I'm not coming round to check up on you. Although metaphorically, you could pretend I am if it helps. Because I'll do anything to help you get this. Literally. Sorry to interrupt myself, but if you enjoyed this video, it would really help us out if you liked it below and just click subscribe. Oh, and if you're a business owner and you want even more content like this, then you should become a member of Entrepreneur Circle. You can try it out completely for free just by clicking the link in the description and you'll unlock instant access to a treasure trove of business growth resources. There's templates, there's tools, there's training, there's lots more. Just click the link in the description and I'll see you on the inside. Now, hmm, back to me. Everything, I talked about yesterday about Entrepreneur Circle kind of being, at the risk of standing, I'm completely on my own ass. I, I feel like EC is like the reason I'm on this planet. It, it's, 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 it, it, for me, it's like everything now. And it's all about impact. It's about the difference that EC can make. But unless or until each individual member of EC is carving out some time on a rhythmic, consistent basis until they are committed in some way to carving out that time and literally manifesting the will to act. Unless or until that happens, everything else we do, to a large extent, is pointless. That matters a lot. 
try to phrase it another way for you. I mentioned habits a minute or two ago. This, was, this is a, a reflective learn on my part. And um, we, we do get, we get to, <laughs> we, we, we get to decide our future insofar as we get to choose what we're shooting at, what we're aiming at. But just thinking it or wanting it doesn't make it happen. We're all big boys and girls. We know that now. What makes it happen is our habits. You know, I can't shed the stone that my wife would like me to lose just by willing it. I've tried, by the way. Um, you know, got another holiday coming up. Oh, I'm going to get all this grief. Come on, shrink, shrink, shrink. Um, it doesn't, doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Um, I've even tried tightening the belt to see if it no, doesn't, doesn't work. doesn't work. The only way I, you know, I can get into trim is I've got to eat a bit less shit and move a bit more. And for that to happen, I've got to integrate some new habits. It's the same thing with your business. It's the same principle. We all get, you get the intellectual logic of that. You know, if you want to build this business to, to, into something beyond what it is right now, if you want to move up that pyramid into the 15 and the 4 and the 1, what you've got to do is get the right habits. And what I discovered, thanks to Martin Howey, in March 2003, I discovered that the, the absolute golden ticket to building a business is the habit of having 90 minutes every single day, completely ring-fenced off and away from the rest of the world, because no one can get to me. My phone doesn't ever ring. I don't, my inbox, my emails are shut down. There's no notifications come up. I am undisturbable for 90 minutes. And just like you, you know, when I'm in the zone and focused, I'm prolific. The same way that you are. When we actually concentrate and get on without the thing that we're there to do, we can make amazing stuff happen in really quite short amounts of time. But if we haven't carved out the time, it doesn't happen. And another day goes by, and then another day goes by, and then another week goes by, and then we realize that actually our business hasn't moved forward, and that maybe we're not cut out for this entrepreneur. Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just doomed to be in the 60% forever. The 60% that spend their life in endless financial struggle. It's a fucking choice. It's an absolute choice to be in the 60%. I mentioned some of the symptoms of the 60% yesterday. You know, the struggle of every quarter to pay the VAT bill. The dread in the pit of your stomach when you know payroll's three days away and you have no idea how you're going to make it. That becomes a habit. That becomes a regular feature of your life. You're in the 60%. The only way out of it is to change your habits. The habit that will decide your future is finding a way, some way, somehow. I mean, it's not the hardest thing to do. Carve out the 90 minutes. If you're, if you're not a morning person, then do it in the evening. It doesn't matter when you do it. I'm not saying you have to do it first thing in the morning. I recognize fully that some people are night owls. You know, I'm, I, I become less and less effective and less and less productive as the day goes on. Some people are the exact opposite. Uh, if you're a night owl, your 90 minutes needs to happen towards the end of the day when you're at your best. But unless or until you put this habit in place, the likelihood is things won't change that much. And that's why it's like the most important thing. Now, I've used Batman, Michael Caine, Christian Bale, Liam Neeson. I've worked on this little bit. This, this little bit is the only bit of the whole two days that I worked through in terms of exactly what I was going to say and how I was going to say it. I choreographed it so that even on the live stream, it would be most effective and most powerful because I was moving in time with the words because somehow I've got to get this. is my, my mission, my goal is to get this bit. I don't, comparatively speaking, I don't care about the rest of the two days. If I could crack this bit, if I could get 100 people at this event out of the 13 or 1,400 we've got on it. I get 100 people committing to this habit. That would make a big impact. How can I get 200 people? 
we get 500 people in this habit, what would start to happen? What would start to happen? I can't do it for you. All I can do is articulate and communicate in the most powerful way I know possible. And forgive me if it's not enough, because I've really tried to articulate in the right way. But not content with Michael Caine and Christian Baird and Liam Neeson, I've also mobilized Warren Buffett. Genuine quote from the maestro. Look at this. This is profound, isn't it? To succeed in business, you don't have to be smarter than the rest. You just have to be more disciplined than the rest. I don't think this is, this might not be in the workbook, this one. As I said, there's a couple of weeks between the workbook going to print and, um, and this and this is be properly focused on how I get this across. I'll leave that slide up for a moment or two so you can scribble it down. To succeed in business, you don't have to be smarter than the rest. You just have to be more disciplined than the rest. I mean, that, to some extent, that could, be like, that could be like my epitaph. It absolutely could be my epitaph. Uh, I would be the first to admit, you know, I'm a long way down the pecking order when it comes to smartness of business brains. But there aren't many people who beat me for discipline. 21 years, I've been doing me 90 minutes. And it's been a breeze. It's been the easiest thing it is to do because every day I make progress towards where I want to be. And the 90 minutes is all about me and my business and the success that I want to achieve for my customers, for my staff, for my family. It's easy. It's an easy habit once I get into it. I mentioned yesterday, Martin Gladish and I wrote that book. It's still available on Amazon if you want to get a copy. Uh, but you don't need to. I've just paraphrased the entire book for you in 10 minutes. There's, there's, you know, I've got loads more examples and stuff in there, loads more stories, but you don't need the book. F fuck it, don't buy the book. No, that's the last thing. No, I'm serious. You don't, you don't need to buy the book. Intellectually, you've already got it. You know it makes sense. You don't need to buy another book that will sit on the shelf. You don't need to buy a book that will make you feel like you're making progress, but you're not really. Because even if you read it, it doesn't make a jot of difference. It's only when you make the, act in the emotional and the actual switch, that's when it makes a difference. And you don't need the book to do that. You need to open your calendar and start blocking out the time. And then you need to ring fence it and make it immovable, undeletable. Then email support at Entrepreneur Circle and I'll send you a sign. I will send you that sign. You can hang on your door. Do not disturb unless building is on fire. Then you can talk to your husband or your wife or your significant other, and you can let them know that you won't be answering the phone between these times. And by the way, much better when the time is the same time. So for me, it's, it is always the first night. When I get to it, it's the first 90 minutes. Because it becomes easy. That's when it becomes a habit. I don't have to think about it. Just do it. But Sue knows she'd never, she'd never try and ring me because she knows what I'm doing. The staff know they can't come in because the door's locked. The last thing I do at night before I go home is I close down the window on my browser that's got my inbox in it. Because even if I have a little sneaky look, first thing in the morning, it gets in, it's insidious, it gets in your brain. Even if I don't open the email, I just look at who's emailed me overnight. Can't do that, it's all shut down. Not even open the emails until nine o'clock. Everything will wait till nine o'clock. Whatever any customers are saying or asking, it'll wait till nine o'clock. Do the most important thing. I can embrace the will to act. I can adopt that habit. When you do, it will make a really big difference. You'll be stunned at how quickly things start to move forward. 90 minutes a day is equal to seven and a half hours a week. Seven and a half hours a week is 30 hours a month. 30 hours of you at your most productive. 30 hours a week of you, your most effective, focusing on the things that are the most important to you. Everything in my journey, everything in my odyssey has been built in 90-minute chunks. And starting tomorrow, starting tomorrow, on a Wednesday in February, in 2024, your odyssey could begin. The new chapter 
could begin because you could embrace that habit. But you might not. Sadly, experience tells me that most people listening to this now, no matter how fervent you're believing right now, this is the right thing to do. Yes, Nige, I am with you. I know what will happen. Just between here and the journey back to your place of work tomorrow, other things will get in the way. The day-to-day -day will emerge. It will strangle your dreams. It's true. You'll stay in the 60%. The way we do anything is the way we do everything. Nodding sagely, agreeing with what's being said, but then doing fuck all about it tells you and me and everybody else awful lot about where you're likely to end up. What we do with others, especially when there's not an audience, when there's nobody looking, there's nobody seeing. I mean, the, 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 the classic one here is the boxers, isn't it? You know, the boxers who you know, emerge in the ring. Anthony Joshua looks incredible physical specimen, you know, and he battles in the ring with whoever he's fighting this month, <laughs> whatever title it is. But the boxers have, you know, it's, it's not what they do in the ring ultimately that, that gets them their success. It's what's gone on outside the ring in the early mornings in the dark when they've been plowing the, you know, getting the miles under their belt in the gym, working day after day, when there was no one looking, there was no one watching. That's when they know who they are. That's when they know what they're capable of. That's when they'll know what we'll achieve. And we have the same for us business owners, the same as business owners. If you haven't got your 90 minutes, you're making it almost impossible to become sustainably successful. You might get lucky. Although even if you get lucky, what will happen is you'll be a bit of success and then it will wane again. Without the 90 minutes, I genuinely don't know how you do it, how you make it happen. I feel you, for sure you're going to be condemned to stay in the 60%. We've all seen this little, you know, the classic thing about getting the, getting the big stuff in the jar. You know, if we, put the, um, if we put the little stuff in the jar, we put the sand and the gravel in the jar, there's no room for the big pebbles. But if we put the big pebbles in the jar first, then we can get the gravel in around it and the sand fills in and fills up the gaps and everything fits in the jar. That's the perfect metaphor for what the 90 minutes is all about. It's the perfect metaphor for how the majority of business owners, especially those in the 60 and the 20, spend every working day. Because they do all the little stuff first. It's the day to day that kills their dreams. All the sand and all the gravel is well taken care of. But there's no room in their day for the pebbles, the big stuff. And as a consequence, the big stuff never gets done. And as a consequence, the business doesn't move forward. And what happens is it gets overtaken and others start to take their customers, others start to take their business, others start to collect their market share, their margins erode. The business owner blames everybody but themselves, of course, for this but they put the wrong stuff in the jar in the wrong order. Uh, that's where he went wrong. The 90 minutes is about you. It's about your business. It's about your priorities. It's about achieving your goals. Your customers don't get a look in in your 90 minutes. The rest of the day is for them. Your staff don't get a look in in your 90 minutes. The rest of the day is about dealing with them. 90 minutes is all it is. Most of us work eight or nine hours a day in truth. There's still plenty of time left for all the little stuff. And by the way, you can embrace and enjoy the little stuff. Hell, you can even get out on the tools if you want to, because once you know you've done the important stuff, the big stuff, it's a lot, lot easier, a lot, lot better. Um, but no room for staff or customers um, in your 90 minutes. Um, I, I had to cut out um, Ted Lasso from this presentation. Um, there was too much stuff to get into the two days. But this is a, a kind of gratuitous reference to, to, to Ted. And many of you know I'm a big fan of Ted Lasso. It's the, the most fabulous. I believe it's the most wonderful TV show that's ever been made, literally ever. Uh, and every time I watch it, you can take more from it. it, it it's, a, it's a genuine, beautiful thing. And, and, and Ted himself is so profound as a character. And um, there's the, my favourite, favourite scene is, uh, is Ted playing darts against Rupert. And uh, the stakes are very, very high. 
and Rupert's got his own set of darts and Ted throws left-handed to begin with and Rupert thinks he's not very good and he puts down very big stakes and Rupert thinks he's going to absolutely squash Ted and it turns out that Ted's a really demon dart player but Rupert never found out because he was judgmental. He was never curious. And uh, this poster sits in our entranceway at Entrepreneur Circle. As you walk in our door, you see this picture of Ted Lasso with that phrase there. It's a Walt Whitman quote. Be curious, not judgmental. You look around at businesses that have achieved a lot of success. Really interesting to get curious about what's made it so. Anyone ask me, Nige, how have you managed to build this business into one that's you know, sustainably very successful now? I said, I built it in 90 minute chunks. The single biggest, most important thing. And all I can do is offer it to you, and try and communicate to you the significance and importance of it. There's a whole lot of tools, by the way, of things you can do in your 90 minutes. I still use my 90 minute planner. Uh, again, if you want one of those, email or support, I'll send you one. I mean, it's the simplest bloody document that we could produce some pads on them. But this is what I do. I just put my little notes in. I'm, I'm usually mapped out a couple of weeks ahead with my 90 minutes because I've got something to do. I can't squash it all in. So I'll just, I just keep going, you know, the pad, it's a pad. So I start to fill them up. I've got, you get good over time. You get better at understanding what, how long things will take. And sometimes things need two or three 90 minute sessions because they're significant pieces of work. Other days I might get two or three things done in a single 90 minute session. But I used to use that, that pad sits on my desk. I just fill the columns in. It's dead, not, not very complex, not very difficult, um, but it feeds my habit. And it's a really good habit. Um, and that's there for you. And, and ultimately, just to, to kind of wrap this little bit up, really, you know, this is a, a kind of profound thought that I've reflected quite a lot on. Because I do believe when it, you know, let's, let's, let's forget business for a minute. Let's look at life in the round. And isn't it true that how we allocate our time, whether we think about it consciously or just allow things to happen to us, it's how we allocate our time that determines whether actually we have a successful life as measured by us individually, because we all get to choose what success looks like for us. I'm not in any way trying to impose, you know, my definition of success onto you. You get to choose what success means for you. But, but I promise you now, the extent to which you achieve it will be influenced massively by how you allocate your time. It applies to our health, it applies to our happiness. It applies to our relationships. It all comes down to how we allocate time. And that definitely applies in business. So that was a meaningful start to day two. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's the, the, the importance of us getting going there and how that works. Quick little thing here that I found helped me a little bit um, is um, just want to just briefly share this with you because it's, it, it's helped me a lot as this. Because the thing is, as a business owner, there's always tons of stuff to do. And, and um, what I discovered is quite a lot of the stuff that ostensibly there is to do actually never needs to be done. And so I have um, a little list and I have an A list, a B list and a C list. And, and the A list is something that is really important and significant and my a list effectively manifests itself on that 90 minute planner because that's the things that have really got to happen for for me in my business um the b list is stuff that i do want to get done i think it's important and it'll get done in the day-to-day -day time and not in the 90 minutes it'll get done in the rest of the time and then there's c list and c list is the stuff that i might kind of think needs to happen, but actually it's not that important uh, to anybody. And what I've discovered with the C list is you never have to do the C list. You put things on the C list, but you never have to do them. Because what happens is it either becomes significantly important that it has to get moved up to the B list, or actually it just withers and dies on the C list. And, and there's lots of people, I, I, I'm a big believer that life is too short to file, for instance. You know, many, many years ago, so I, I just have a pile. So, because what's we, we get stuff, don't we? You know, things will come in the post, or so I just put it in a pile, and 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 after a while, the pile becomes quite big. So I put some other bands around it, and I put a little piece of paper on top that says, you know, January twenty three to June twenty three, and I put the pile in the cupboard, and and on the very very rare occasion that I need to go and find something. It doesn't take me more than a few minutes to find it because it's in a pile in a I'll find it. I'll get some sense somewhere as to where it is. Whereas I'd, I'd spend like hours filing everything. Life's too short to file. 
um, a life to live. I can't die with a God. I think terrible if you die with everything organized properly. Terrible. Um, but the, the most useful thing uh, with lists is the fridge. And um, this is my fridge. And um, it, it's an A3 um, sketchbook, actually, is my fridge. The paper's really thick in it. It's an A3 book. For me, that's quite helpful. So the fridge, um, this, this, I think this will be very, very helpful uh, for people. Just get yourself a, 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 a book. Uh, it needs to be a, a sizable notebook. You can't carry it because it's an A3. It just kind of stays where it is. Stays just on the floor, leaned up against my desk is where it stays, is, is, is the fridge. I stuck that thing on the front of me. It says the fridge. And, and what I do in the fridge, I put the things that I think I want to do, but I can't do now. So we have ideas for the business. We might want to go, oh, there's this, we could run this, or we do this, or we can do that. So I'll, I'll, and, but oh, I can't do it now. There's no time. I've got, I've got clarity of focus for the next month or quarter. So, so what I do is I put it in the fridge, and it's liberating. So I will just take a, you know, two or three minutes. I'll jot it down, any thoughts I've got. I'll put it in the fridge, make it clear what, if it's really significant. It might get its own page in the fridge. Because what fridges do in our kitchens, fridges keep things fresh. That's why I call it the fridge, because it's not forgotten about. It's not, it, hasn't, it hasn't gone in the attic. You know, I've not put it in the basement where it's going to be linger forever. It's in the fridge. And, and what I will do at the start of each quarter when we're doing our planning, for them, well, I'll look at the, what's in the fridge, and I'll see if I need to bring something else. And we're going to do that. We'll, we'll put that in the plan for this quarter. But once I put things in the fridge, I can let go of it in my head. But the fridge is, you know, I, I, I do much to my wife's frustration sometimes. When I, when I go to bed, I go to sleep like really quickly and really easily. And, and, and typically I will, I will stay asleep for, for seven or eight hours. And I sleep and I value that really hugely because it means I wake up energized and I can come at the day with great gusto. And my fridge is one of the reasons why, because I, I get things off my head into a place, I know it's safe, I know it's been kept fresh, it's not been forgotten about, just a simple little technique, i just share it with you. Might be helpful to some people. Um, <laughs> as might this fella, oh, this guy. Um, this guy, this is our, um, this is our 800 pound gorilla. Look at him, what a great specimen he is. Um, this, this guy is, um, is responsible for um, for quite a lot of business owners in particular, failing to achieve the things that they are capable of and that they ostensibly wish to achieve. Because the 800-pound gorilla in your life, and we all have one, by the way, um, we all, we've all got this fellow with us. Um, it's just that for some people he's more active than others. But the 800-pound gorilla, it manifests, it's our fear of failure. Because as human beings, and particularly as products of the, of the late 20th century, as most of us are, um, we, um, we've been hardwired you know, by our education system and by our society you know, to, to want to be right. And um, failing at things and being wrong is, strikes viscerally uh, with almost all of us as, as human beings. And when you're building a business, this is not helpful. Um, because when you're building a business, as I talked about yesterday, you know, especially when it's looking at the marketing and the selling of a business, not everything will, will work out really well. You'll try some things that will fundamentally fail. Um, you'll test things out, take things out to the market, and they'll crash and burn, metaphorically speaking. You don't get the responses that you want. You don't get the engagement. You don't get the appointments. You don't make the sales. And it's our fear of failure that stops us from doing a lot of stuff because we overanalyze and we overthink and we try and cover off every base possible so we can avoid failure. And, and, and what I discovered kind of happens is that when we're confronted with the potential to achieve the kind of freedom that the successful business will give for us. <laughs> so what happens is so many people focus on all the things that might go wrong. And why, why on earth we do this? And it all oh, goes back to our, our fear of failure. And once we start to think about the things that can go wrong, what happens in our brains is we start to withdraw and push away from the opportunities that are there kind of in, 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 in front of us. And in my experience, this is, it manifests itself um, in, the, uh, you know, in, in, in procrastination. Uh, we get right deep down into that. As I said yesterday, I am a 
fucking masterful procrastinator. Um, I'm incredibly good at it. Uh, I will take anybody on at procrastination. Um, I've had to resort to really extreme length. I'll talk about one or two of them in a minute or two about how I've, how I've you know, got um, to, to deal with that and, and, and tackle it. The 90 minutes, by the way, is, is a really big part um, of that. But what would happen in, in your business, in your life, if you stopped looking for all the things that could go wrong? What would happen if you stopped making up things to be frightened of? What would happen if you stopped inventing threats? You know, what would happen? I know, we, you know we, uh, if we were able to just, you know, let's, let's give this a go. Let's commit, not dabble. Let's actually do this. Um, because when you start to work it through properly and you start to think smartly about it, not emotionally, you realize that the worst thing that could happen is rarely very significant. It's rarely very, 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 very big. And, and the truth is, even if you do fail, actually the failure gives you power. This was a big factor for us. And Cameron and I talk quite a bit about this because when, when, when something fails with our marketing, what we're, we've become very good at is just, you reckon, okay, that campaign has not worked. What can we learn from that campaign? What feedback is it giving us? Because if we're able to look at that and understand it, that feedback becomes knowledge. And we all know that knowledge gives us power because the more we know, the better equipped we are so we can go back and we can recycle and we can find different ways to tackle particular problems. And it applies at a very basic level. As I mentioned yesterday, there's people in this room, there's people on this broadcast who have given up on Google ads or Facebook ads. And just that, that very simple step, which in the short term helps them hugely because I'm now no longer wasting 200, 300, 500, 1,000 pounds a week that I was spending on those ads. So the 800 pound gorilla tells you that you are 800,000 pounds a week better off, except that what you've just done is thrown away the biggest opportunity to take your business to the next level. Rather than treating the experience that you've had with Facebook or with Google as a failure and writing it off completely, what if you looked about it as feedback? Say, crikey, I've not used this very well. These were not the results I was hoping for. What would have to happen to our Facebook campaign for us to turn those results around? What if you got curious, not judgmental, about Google or Facebook, for instance? And I only use those as simplistic examples. There are hundreds more that, that, that I could utilize and use.